Africa Lead for Incubate Energy Lab. Really excited um, and, and very grateful to our team from Australia at IND Technology and our team from Ameren and our other participating utilities and our every subject matter experts for joining us this evening for this awesome um, review of this 2020 cohort project uh, with IND. It's been a great project, it's still ongoing, and um, can't wait for the team here to explain all about it. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Joe Potvin uh, from EPRI to kick us off. Joe, take it away. Maybe double muted. And Joe, have we lost you? It looks like we may have lost Joe. Does. Okay, I can pick it up if you like. What do you think? We're white for Go. Joe? Or? Go right ahead, Tony. It may take him a few minutes to come back. Yeah, while we're uh, waiting for Joe, I'll just introduce the three speakers who will be uh, talking today. Uh, Joe from EPRI, uh, Senior Technical Leader. Uh, EPRI sponsored the project at Ameren uh, to trial EFD early fault detection on their systems. Jeff Hackman, who's on the call from Ameren, Director of Transmission Operations, and myself, Tony Markson. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. Um, So there is a report, an EPRI published report, uh, dated March 20, 2021, on the uh, project with Ameren. And uh, this is uh, available in the EPRI um, website, the Incubate Energy Labs uh, 2020 reports, I think it is. Uh, so uh, feel free to grab a copy of that. It's a very succinct brief report of the project as it stood at that point. Project, project is still running. Um, the um, thing that was different about this project was that uh, it actually installed early fault detection on transmission lines as well as subtransmission and distribution. So it covered everything from 12 kV to 138 kV uh, of the Ameren system. Um, and uh, we got some really good results uh, fairly quickly. Uh, it was very, you know, from uh, normally early fault detection, you pick up things as they happen. So sometimes things take a while to appear, um, but we found some stuff which was really good in the uh, short time before the project report was published. Uh, and the project is still ongoing. So you know, we will find more things. Uh, is Joe back on the call yet, Amy? I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can, Joe. Do you want to add anything to that? I, I stood in for you, mate. <laughs> yeah, thanks mate. for that, Tony. My, uh, right as Annie started, my internet connection just died. <laughs> so I was scrambling on my end. Yeah, so um, I only heard the tail end of that. Do you want me... I don't know how far in you got. So if you want me to give an intro, I can intro. Uh, um, or if you just want to take it off and we can go yeah, either I've, way. I've introduced the three of us and uh, okay. I've just uh, put the um, EPRI one page slide up, the EPRI report slide up. So uh, yep. but my, people would be interested in your view as the EPRI guy on the project. Yeah. Huh? Sure. So, yeah, let me just take a minute to do that. So I guess, first of all, hi everyone, I'm Joe Potvin. Uh, sorry I'm late. Um, I lead the overhead distribution asset research at EPRI. So Incubate Energy expo it exposes uh, both utilities and EPRI project leaders really, such as myself, uh, to, to companies like IND that offer advanced or innovative solutions to different utility challenges. So one that I work with specifically 
um, and this is where my perspective comes in, is that one challenge is that is, uh, it's one research objective, I should say, focuses on overhead line inspection and the technologies available that utilities can use to detect issues or to improve awareness of uh, equipment condition or health. Um, typically though, a lot of those technologies you're bringing out to the line on a, to the line on a periodic basis, whether it's uh, infrared or uh, some sort of elect electric discharge detection or just visually inspecting it. But this tool is one where, where you actually deploy it and it's giving you back near real time monitoring um, capability. So my role as an SME for this project was to help guide the, the parameters of the demonstration that, that the guys are gonna go over um, and just make sure the product is getting a fair evaluation under reasonable conditions. So as far as the actual de description of that demonstration, um, I'm gonna leave it up to, to Tony and, and Jeff to lead us through that. So thanks for that, Tony. Thanks, Joe. I might just very briefly mention uh, or introduce <clears throat> IND technology that the um, company, we're based in Melbourne, uh, Australia. Uh, we're quite uh, young, uh, small and very innovative, growing very rapidly though. We have uh, uh, early fault detection systems now uh, installed on three continents and uh, the business is growing in all three. Um, we're getting good feedback from our customers. They're, they're seeing good results and you'll see the results in the Ameren case in this presentation. But you can see up until last year, we had mainly local Australian utilities were starting to pick it up. But uh, since uh, 2020 onwards, uh, the list of partners that we're working with around the world has, has grown enormously and we are experiencing the same sort of growth in 2021 as well. So young, innovative, very rapidly growing, the product's being very well received and we're getting a lot of repeat business. Where did we start from? Well, uh, we were interested in finding a way of predicting pole fires. Um, Alan Wong, who's on the call, our CEO, who's the inventor of early fault detection technology um, and who set up IND technology to commercialize it, um, developed it in the lab, tested it in the field, and then a utility picked it up and said, we'd like to see if it'll predict pole fires. So uh, it was installed on a few short sections of power line in Melbourne. And uh, we, we actually had experience where early fault detection uh, predicted or detected the conditions for pole fires at specific poles about 30 days ahead. So this is a case that you can see on the screen. This pole, the early fault detection system said uh, this pole is at risk of a pole fire. And uh, we alerted the utility, they went out, uh, had it inspected, the inspection crew had instructions not to touch anything, just to look at it and report back. And they said, well, there's nothing, nothing visible. This is a normal pole, looks like it's in good condition. Um, bit of moss on the cross arm, but not much, no, you know, that's normal. Um, the early fault detection system kept uh, alerting us and we uh, spoke to the utility and they sent out their most experienced asset inspector and he looked at it, same, in, same writing instructions, don't touch, don't fix, just inspect and said, no, uh, I can't identify anything wrong with this pole. And uh, about two and a half weeks later, this is what happened. Uh, there was a, what a, what was going on was that there was discharge inside the bowl between the king bolt that holds the cross arm and the wood of the pole. So it, it caught fire one morning. We had other similar uh, instances where similar lead times, 30, 33 days, 
in advance warning. Bit of a surprise to everyone because everyone thought, well, pole fires are something that happens over the space of about 24 hours. Uh, but to find that you could actually find particular poles that were going to have pole fire 30 days in advance was something completely new. So what is early fault detection? <clears throat> it's an Internet of Things system that's laid over uh, electricity infrastructure. It can be a distribution network, any sort of power line network. It can be uh, the infrastructure inside a substation, electric rail networks, um, industrial sites. We've got them all. Um, the only visible bit of it is the data collection uh, equipment. It's a passive listening system that operates in the radio frequency band. So there's no actual connection to the conductors in the infrastructure, the live conductors. Uh, and there is a fair bit of processing that goes on at the site and a digest of the radio frequency signal is sent up to the cloud for the really heavy duty processing. Uh, and that cloud server drives a web portal uh, which uh, the owner of the infrastructure can use to assess the risk uh, along the power lines and uh, if things are emerging, decide to take action. Uh, usually an inspection first, uh, sometimes an asset replacement, depending on what is appearing in the system. So the things to remember is that there's no connection. It's a passive listening uh, concept operating at radio frequencies. Uh, it, you don't need a, an outage of the uh, power line to install it, although we're finding many of the utilities uh, take the opportunity to do work on the pole uh, and sometimes to actually replace the pole, uh, which of course can require an outage. So here's some examples. Um, uh, US and Australia, so US on the left, Australia on the right. Uh, you can see there are three capacitive coupling sensors looking at, like facing the power line conductors about a metre away, about you know, 30 to 35 inches away. Uh, they have coax cables that run down to a control unit on the side of the pole. Uh, these two are both mains, <coughs> secondary mains powered units. It only draws about five or 10 watts, so it's a minimal power drain. Uh, and you can see the antenna uh, that communicates via 3G. The one on the right, the Australian one, has got a weather station on the pole as well. Uh, these days we would, we have a weather station bracket which holds the weather station well out away from the pole so it doesn't get pole wake di distortion in the wind readings. The thing that makes it different is its position on the uh, bow tie chart. So you be familiar with this, you've got the threats down the left and you've got the risks down the right. Uh, and in between there's a loss of control event, usually a network fault, a uh, power line fault or something like that. So the, the ranking of threats is for Australian or for Victorian uh, distribution networks. Some are very frequent, like vegetation touches, uh, and uh, others are fairly rare. Uh, it, all the ones in green, early fault detection predicts. Uh, the ones in blue, it's a bit hard to predict uh, if, a fall, if a pole is going to fall over or if a tall tree is going to fall across the line from outside the clearance zone, or if an animal is suddenly going to decide to interfere with the asset. Uh, but everything else uh, we tend to see on the early fault detection. So early fault detection is a threat barrier. It's in the same position on the chart as asset inspection and things like that, um, except that it's continuous. It's not point in time, as Joe mentioned. It's every second of every day uh, this, this system is scanning or listening to the network. On the other side of the fault, of course, you've got all the usual mitigating uh, processes, protection and control systems and th things like that. So it's a different, it's on the, it's a, at a, on a different side of the chart to most 
systems that so so what does an early fault look like well here's one they're pretty hard to see uh even when you're right there you know we got out of the truck looking around where is it you know we knew it was on this span we knew it was about 20 meters away from the pole um and sure enough uh, there it is this is a close-up of the same thing and you can see there are multiple broken conductors here um, uh, strands sorry conductor strands and one of them is progressively unraveling and that would continue to unravel until it uh, was long enough to reach the next the phase next to it and in which case it would disappear in a, a bright flash and a shower of molten metal onto the ground below but um yeah so uh, we have uh, found that early fault detection systems are really good at finding conductor damage um uh, this this is just one example but we have lots and lots of examples now we started writing up these uh, cases early on uh, and now we're sort of at the point now where we're hardly bothering to write them up because they're found they're fixed and and everyone moves on so broken primary conductor strands like this and you can see some of these are really uh, at a point where the power line is at serious risk of falling down um, and uh, so they they're all repaired in time to prevent that happening um, which averts public safety risk fire starts things like that we also find them on secondary strands so the thing that we found very early on was that radio frequency signals generated by broken strands uh, actually travel through transformers quite well so we can locate broken strands on secondary conductors uh, just as well as we can find them on primary conductors um, so if you look at the photo on the bottom right that's a local one here that's a uh, three core customer service line it was it's it's called by the line crews licorice strap because it's a flat uh, rubber uh, strap that's got three cores running through it and you can see how internal discharge is just progressively eaten away the insulation until there's been quite a serious failure this one we alerted the utility to uh, about three and a half days before it actually failed in fact it failed while the crew were on their way to to uh, investigate it we find other forms of conductor damage so this is uh, line slap damage uh, you can see where the um, the slapping and the arcs that it produces have actually melted strands and broken strands uh, it is interesting that this uh, these particular instances were far out along the circuit and distribution circuit and the arc in a very windy area and the arcs actually blew out before the protection operated so this particular location was seeing repeated conductor slaps when the wind was uh, in the right direction and at the right speed uh, but the line was not tripping so we could see along this span multiple instances of this type of damage we've seen uh, bullet damage on the on the left there um, and we've seen multiple instances of that now uh, these are you know, that's a us photo that one we see bird caging where that's a workmanship issue uh, pretty hard to avoid in some conditions but it should be uh, better than the examples shown there um, probably the most common thing we find is close approaches and actual contact of vegetation on the uh, both the high voltage and low voltage conductors so You've got extreme examples like the left hand photo this was the first uh, us uh, defect that we actually identified it was 
it, it appeared, it was obvious basically within hours of commissioning the system. And uh, we asked the utility to, you know, if they wouldn't mind getting someone out there to take a look at it. And this is one of the photos that the fault crew returned. It's a secondary uh, a bare wire service. And um, actually the dead branch across the three wires has obviously sat there for a long time and has had time to dry out. Uh, but it was a green sapling that was, uh, it's not in the photo, it's a bit off to the right. Uh, that was probably the thing that we were picking up. Uh, dead branches like that actually become quite good insulators after a while. Uh, in the middle, you've got an example of what we call a pruning fault, where the branch touches a line, the branch dies back, uh, which uh, fixes the problem for a while, then the branch regrows and it all goes through the same cycle again. <clears throat> We've also had direct vegetation touches on high voltage, 22 kV uh, on the right hand photo there and up to 66 kV uh, vegetation actually touching the line. So it's uh, something that early fault detection systems pick up um, with depressing regularity. We find some pretty subtle faults. Uh, this one, a failed insulator pin, which allowed the insulator to sit down and start to roll uh, onto the cross arm. Um, the, these are old wooden peg insulators. Uh, this defect was actually more than a thousand feet off on a tap line. Uh, from the monitored power line, but it showed up at the point where the tap line uh, joined the power line. And when we walked the uh, tap line, sure enough, there it was. Uh, the skirt, you can't really see in this photo, but the skirt under the uh, insulator was pretty filled with dirt um, because it had sat down and rolled over. And obviously the creepage path length had been greatly shortened by this failure of the peg. Middle photo again, it's a failed insulator that's pulled out of a, uh, a split cross arm, a failed cross arm, uh, which has left the transformer secondary terminals taking the full strain of a very long overhead service line to a customer, uh, about 50 metres. Um, and obviously the, uh, the strain was producing cracks in the insulators uh, and we were seeing partial discharge uh, at the transformer. We also see things like the broken insulator shed on the right hand photo. Um, we've seen a few of those. Uh, they're, they're not all that common, but they do show up quite clearly. We've even discovered uh, beehives in poles because the, we're not quite sure. We think the bees land on the conductor and that sh gives us a signal. These are uh, malfunctioning fuses. So the one on the left has candled. Uh, we don't see these before they happen, but we certainly see them when they happen. The one on the right looks like it hung up uh, instead of releasing cleanly. Um, so, and you can see the burn or the melted plastic around the top contact. Um, yeah, so, so sometimes we see stuff as it happens uh, that isn't producing signal before it happens, uh, but probably 95% plus of our uh, identifications are well before the event. Here's a few more cases. So the one on the left is a transformer that got hit by lightning, uh, even though it's got a surge diverter on it. It was obviously damaged, had an internal uh, problem, and uh, that was uh, generating a lot of radio frequency signal. That one we uh, discovered uh, overnight. We had to wait until the morning and get a crew out there we were worried that we didn't know it was a transformer. We were worried it might be a line on the ground that uh, hadn't been picked up by the protection. Um, 
So we tried to get the crew out as early as possible to deal with what we thought might be a public safety risk. Um, and they had difficulty finding anything. Uh, and uh, they called me and said, no, there's nothing here. We're going back to depot. And I said, no, it's still there. I can see it. And uh, uh, they turned their truck engine off and immediately heard this transformer uh, making a racket. So when they tested it, it was fully energized, but it had no volts on the secondary output. So problem found. The middle one, loose clamps, arcing clamps, we've seen a few of those. Uh, they generate uh, quite a lot of radio frequency signal. Uh, this one was in the US. We've seen similar here in uh, in Victoria. You can see they, they generate quite a bit of heat and they start to melt the plastic guard. The right hand one is bark on the line, uh, stringy bark. Eucalypts shed these long strips of bark which can hang over the conductors and they blow along the line uh, until they reach a cross arm or a post insulator and they can actually uh, cause, eventually cause flashover. Um, but we see them fairly well and we can see that they move so that's a, uh, a sign that something is moving along the line. So Pacific Gas and Electric in uh, California installed early fault detection on two circuits uh, up in the Napa Valley area and uh, operated them for quite a while. They did this project under their um, EPIC uh, shared funding, shared R&D arrangements that apply in California um, and the report basically reported very successful results um, that uh, early fault detection could identify and locate partial discharge to within plus or minus 25 feet that can't be de detected by other technologies. Um, so they were, uh, they rated it as potentially able to deliver a material benefit in fire risk mitigation and uh, all three of the bigger Californian utilities uh, have early fault detection you know, systems installed and uh, repeat customers for us. So those installations are expanding uh, and it's likely they'll expand at, to very large scale over the next few years. Um, pg and &E, did in their report uh, say that it would be good to have a data integration and analytics platform because they wanted to uh, cross correlate the early fault detection data with other data such as weather, customer metering data, uh, line inspection data and so on. So uh, we've been uh, working with collaborating with them as they uh, develop that concept. So I think I might at this point uh, uh, hand over to Jeff Hackman from Amarin to talk a little bit about the project on Amarin's system. Jeff, Tony, just tell me. Just yeah, tell I'll tell me you when to advance. Yep, thank you much. Yeah. I appreciate it. So uh, when we got into the uh, Incubate Energy uh, presentations and, and uh, I had the uh, good fortune to see IND's presentation, Everything that Tony has just showed you was pretty much, uh, other than the you know the 2020 PG&E stuff, was uh, was kind of what they were what they were presenting, and it it really uh, opened my eyes into some uh, opportunities that Amron was looking to do, uh, in you know in trying to eliminate a lot of manual patrols, uh, improve customers' uh, satisfaction in the reliability area. But additionally, kind of, you know, worrying about those threats, we, we have a number of places where our facilities go through national forests. And while we do have a little more rain than California does, you know, uh, the fires can still occur if you've got, um, you know, conductors on the ground. And so we're very interested in what they could do. You know, the side, this kind of the exciting part of it was that there were a host of, in Tony's slide about, you know, the, the kind of the threat vectors that, you know, the IND can help you with, you know, the, the veg management and kind of just encroaching, not touching 
issues seemed pretty interesting. And so it just seemed like a really good opportunity. I, I've, uh, I have been in uh, Ameren for a long time and had worked in distribution and transmission now in transmission. And I, I was interested in what they had done in distribution. I wanted to see how it might apply in transmission. So we, uh, with with EPRI's uh, support and IND's uh, excellent support, you know, we we decided we'd put some on some transmission. They had done testing in the in their labs that said it would definitely work on transmission, but I really wanted to get a feel for what would we see in transmission, and also you know what challenges might we find, you know, kind of in the installation or operation of the technology that they hadn't seen in distribution. Um, and so it it would just seem like a great opportunity to try something, uh, you know, that that could really uh, be a sweet spot in kind of um, you know uh, early detection, which is of course the name. So Tony, if you go to the next slide, please. So um, Tony went through most of these things, and and again, it was all primarily on uh, the distribution networks. But IND, when we talked to them, you know, in, in the in the incubate energy. Forum, which was outstanding. I would heartily encourage anybody listening that when the next round comes, you know, participate because you'll be amazed at the offerings that people have. You won't, nobody will beat IND Tech, in my opinion, but you can be sure that there'll be somebody that's pretty amazing. But uh, we really wanted to figure out could they, could all these, uh, you know, factors that they'd found on distribution work well in transmission? So I won't read those, and you've heard most of them from Tony. So if we could go to the next slide, please, Tony. So here's uh, pretty much the hardware. It was really simple. It, you know, when we first got into it, we thought it would be a, lo a lot more complex. Uh, you know, specific mounting requirements and 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 uh, a, a lot of difficulty in installing. And again, one of the uh, reasons we we um, went forward with this uh, this trial was to see you know what would we find in a in a host of transmission type installations. And really, there the hardware is very limited, as you can see. I mean, um, if you exclude the weather station, you've got two out of the nine things gone, and uh, pretty much most everything else is in the box, if you will. So you've got some sensors, you've got uh, some coax cable between the sensors and the control box, and then uh, and then an antenna. So it's it's a really simple um, configuration, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, when we get to the next slide, please. So it was very simple. Tony's uh, kindly included a slide with distribution just because it will be a little easier for you to visualize before we get to the um, pictures that we've got coming up. But it's really a simple, um, a, a very simple kind of rule set. You just have to keep the sensors so they're uniform from, you know, so that A, B, and C are uniform distances, right? That it doesn't really matter too much what the distance is uh, as long as they're uniform. Now, um, it, what IND would advise is that, you know, Closer is better, but um, it doesn't have to be close. You know it, what I think the general rule that Tony would tell you, or or um, the other folks would tell you, is that just outside minimum approach distance is fine, um, and that's kind of what we sh we sh we shot for in the uh, wood pole case that you'll see in a minute. Um, and we were a little bit further away on the lattice tower just for an ease of installation problem. But again, we were trying to run it through its gamuts. Not that I don't trust um, Australians, but I just wanted to you know. <laughs> Trust but verify. Sorry, Tony, just had to throw that in. <laughs> the other thing that was really uh, good about it, and uh, you don't just stay where you are, Tony, but I did on the last slide, one of the things that Tony had said and was in indicated on the last slide was the, this five watt thing. That really made it possible for the, the last sentence on this slide. The, the other thing that this kind of is, the fact that it didn't have to have a large power source um, was a, a real benefit to us because then we didn't have to find some place that had to have lots of capacity or make sure that the, the transformer that was nearby was overloaded or or whatever. And in fact, they have uh, solar um, and battery in, you know um, installation opportunities as well. So it, it really opened up the opportunities for us. And again, you know, in a distribution environment, you would expect generally that you would have um, you know uh, secondary voltages nearby. Uh, in a transmission, not always, right? And so, um, so uh, we happen to pick ones that relied on secondary. I have every reason to believe that batteries and solar will work. Um, if not, uh, the U.S. economy is probably mess, going to be messed up here shortly because we're going to rely on that a lot. So anyway, to, not to, to beat a dead horse, the, one of the circuits we put on was a lattice tower circuit out of our uh, uh, Berkeley uh, substation. It, uh, a very uh, old circuit, you know, um, 50s and 60s. Uh, uh, for the for the different ones that leave their uh, lattice tower, 
what uh, it has the reason we picked the circuit was it was it's been a, a problem circuit it has um an awful lot of uh, momentaries relative to the to the rest of the class certainly nothing like distribution but but relative to transmission you know a, a poorer actor if you will uh, but we couldn't uh, identify why it was a poor actor the other thing that kind of was intriguing uh, just you know kind of to push ind to the test was that it had a 34 kv uh, subtransmission under build on it and so we wanted to see if if possibly you know coupling from higher voltages would cause problems in the sensors i mean physics would tell you not but again you never know what you're going to find and so we were very interested in in um in trying to find that the other thing that is of interest was that the the fault currents are extremely high in this location it's got a lot of sources there's generation close and so we thought you know there's a possibility that the sensors would get a chance to ex you know to 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 be subject to extreme fault current type flows and w w how they would behave, what they would report, and you know, would the brackets and things be an issue? Again, didn't IND didn't think there was a case, but again, it's uh, trust but verify. So, so it was uh, a real opportunity for us. So, um, if Tony, if we could go to the next slide, then so here's a um, a, a closer up picture of of the installation. Again, the sensors are are mounted um, in this case, not. Uh, vertically up and down, but horizontally sideways to get over to the conductors. And uh, all, again, the only rule was, is that the sensors need to be, you know, um, the same distance from each of the phases. It was a very um, easy installation. The crews uh, had had no problems whatsoever. We, uh, it, they, they were lightweight, you know, which is nice, you know, so it wasn't a big deal. The, the, the coax uh, could be run kind of independently. You know, you didn't have to have everything connected up and then hope you got it long enough. That was really a, a, a very good deal. So all in all, there were very few rules which the crews found, um, you know, extremely helpful. And the other uh, thing uh, certainly was that IND was, uh, you know, at the ready when we had questions about the installation, which was of course, extremely valuable. Tony, if you'd advance, please. So um, uh, just another picture of that same sensor and then uh, the, uh, the the control unit box. And again, it, it's really kind of like plug and play. Uh, it, 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 the crews really just had to mount it, make sure the antenna was up and then and then get the coaxes in. Uh, IND is currently working on, and Tony can perhaps go into this more, even more of a plug and play architecture. So it would be even easier. We, our crews had no problem whatsoever um, installing it, you know, even at height. Uh, so it was a, a very simple solution. I, I will uh, tell you that on um, one of the upcoming examples um, that we did have, a, we we did burn up one of the power supplies though because uh, IND shipped both terminals with um, insulation, but only it only took 120 volt, and the crews assumed that if there was insulation on both terminals, it was too farty, and so um, INDs fixed that problem as well. So I mean, it's it really was a learning thing. Um, I, I'm sad to say that we had to give them more things to learn, but they did learn some things, I think. So Tony, if you'd go to the next slide, please. So here's a, another one of the circuits that we wanted to try. Um, it's a it's a single uh, wood pole circuit. Uh, it's a 138 kV as well, uh, and we we picked this. It's so it's transmission uh, loop flow circuit. We we picked uh, two different kinds again because we were really just trying to figure out, you know, would we be able to um, have would we have any difficulties in the installation? Was there anything that was going to cause us not to uh, use this thing universally? And so you can kind of see in this one where the sensors are up higher um, and they're again in a horizontal fashion, it just worked out better on both of our circuits that, that that's the way it went. And then the uh, control unit is down um, there down the pole. And we ended up uh, getting longer uh, coax cables, but again, that's really no um, burden whatsoever. So um, Tarni, maybe the next slide, please. Um, this uh, was another circuit that we installed, not a transmission. Um, while um, you know, I'm primarily representing transmission, and and that was really what our primary interest was. Uh, we, I did want to put it on uh, some subtransmission circuits as well. I, I, in my opinion, IND has got a tremendous population of installations on the distribution systems, and I was really trying to figure out, you know, on a thirty on a, a subtransmission. This is a thirty four kV subtransmission circuit. Um, uh, south in southern Missouri in the U.S. And um, uh, I was trying to figure out if we would see the same kinds of results on the underbuild distribution that's on this circuit that, that IND has seen with kind of secondary uh, conductors on their distribution. You know, that when when um, Tony had earlier put up the slide showing the, 
the secondary cabling that was uh, suffering deterioration. You know, the sensors weren't on the secondary. I think that you probably picked up on that. Um, but but that that's the interesting thing about the system is that it can find problems on circuits that are that are associated with it that the sensors are not installed on, which is really um, Im improves the versatility and kind of the expandability of the system, which was really interesting. And so. So um, this is this this is by far the worst performing subtransmission circuit in our two state area, and um, and so it was a, a prime candidate, and it had, because it had underbuild, um, it's so it's rural. It had uh, enough cellular coverage, uh, not great cellular coverage. Again, we were trying to test whether or not you know we could work with, you know, not the best. You know, the other two installations were in the metropolitan uh, St. Louis, Missouri area, so we expected good cellular coverage. Not so much here. If you look on the carrier maps, it's it's you know dicey, and we had a backup. We have a you know portable cellular uh, tower that we can install you know if we needed to, to to work. But in fact, what we found was the IND system worked extremely well with uh, even the spotty cellular coverage that's present, um, and again heavy tree contact. And so that's that's why we installed it. So Tony, perhaps the next slide, please. Um, yeah. so, and I'll turn this over to Tony. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, this is one of the standard charts that early fault detection produces. This is a uh, part of the deep dive uh, suite of charts that's available on the web portal. Um, and it shows that uh, uh, path that was on the last slide. So to understand the chart, uh, along the horizontal axis, you've got meters from sensor B. This is actually the chart of the path between sensors B and C. And the vertical chart is the measured detection energy uh, at all points along that. We, the system uses a time of flight algorithm to locate things. Um, and it measures the energy of the signal. So, and you can see that's a logarithmic scale. So uh, there's a huge range of energy but there is a huge concentration of energy on this path uh, just at one pole. And is the same data, but shown as uh, a um, account of the detections. Now the, the system measures things every second. So there's 86,400 measurements per day uh, times uh, three phases. So you've got about a quarter of a million measurements per day. This poll was generating uh, around uh, 30,000 uh, detections uh, per day. Uh, this is only over a two day period. So this is uh, quite a short period. So uh, it was pretty easy to say, look, there's something there. Uh, it would pay to go and have a look at it uh, just to see you know, and there's a whole stack of other charts that show you which phase it looks like it's on and uh, what are the, what's the electrical signature of it and all sorts of other stuff. But basically this is the thing that says there's something there. So Jeff, back to you. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate that explanation. I, and the, the, the point I did wanna make about that last slide as well is that, you know, once we install these things, um, we immediately uh, saw activity both on the transmission circuits and on the distribution. In some cases, the transmission stuff uh, didn't rise to the level, you know, we inspected and didn't find a, a particular thing uh, right off the bat, uh, but uh, certainly on the distribution, and as Tony mentioned, you know, we, we found, um, at, you know, something exciting right away. The, th this is just a, a, a different, um, uh, a, pre a presentation of, of one of the of that same 34 kV circuit, and it, we did put on distribution, but th that again, that wasn't as interesting as these these other cases. What's n notable about this section was is that it's got you know um, a couple taps uh, in the 30 in the subtransmission circuit, and it does have uh, you know underbuild, and also um, the underbuild even has uh, transformers and, and secondaries. And so, uh, Tony, if you'd go to the next slide, please. So in this section, you know, we um, IND identified the that there was a problem on this pole, you know, and they and they give a a, a very small uh, geographical distance, but I mean it was they were sure it was on the pole plus or minus you know twenty feet or something, you know, so we were pretty sure to look on the pole, 
had we not found anything, you know, we would have expanded the search a little bit. Um, but what we have found uh, when I, when the IND system says it's someplace, it's someplace, which is another one of those things that we were hoping to prove. You know, you didn't have to spend an entire, uh, you know, uh, day looking for something that they found. So it it immediately found that uh, surge arrestor, as you can see in the right picture, you can see the the configuration of the pole. Um, and, and you can see that the, the bracket has got some um, scorching or uh, discoloration at a minimum. And so uh, I think we have a next slide. So we sent the drone crew out and we sent uh, with a Corona camera out with them. And immediately that picked up, you know, uh, uh, right away and said, hey, you got something going here. So we've uh, since sent out, um, you know, a, a, a troubleman and, um, you know, to verify whether it was, you know, connections potentially or whatever, but said that everything looks perfectly fine. It wouldn't, he would never have expected there to be any problem. And so, um, you know, we've got a work order in to remove that surge arrestor and then we'll ship it to EPRI so that they can hopefully learn something from it. I mean, the other thing that I would note, and we, we don't have a slide on it, but it just on this same section, they, they've identified you know, uh, a transformer, a distribution transformer. Again, the sensors are not on the distribution, they're on the subtransmission, but the IND system identified, you know, the exact location of a transformer that uh, that has a, a bad connection, you know, at the at the low voltage terminals. And, um, and, and the system was able to detect that and they were able to tighten up those connections. It's, uh, it was, it proved to us exactly what we were hoping that it would prove, which is that it can find these things, you know, kind of all over on your system. So, uh, Tony, next slide, please. I might talk to this one, Jeff. Perfect. And uh, I think the only thing, if I could just, yeah, in, go in closing it. for me, just, and then I'll give it to you, Tony, is that, you know, for us, uh, what I, what we would, what we're, we're uh, discussing in, internal is that, you know, we, we agree with PG&E that some kind of a data integration platform, which IND is working on, you know, is kind of this, the holy grail of this. Uh, because then you'll be able to get it to run on what I'd call autopilot. I mean, in my world, there's only one employee in a company, but it may be more than that. But but by and large, you know, the, the system would would do all these kinds of things for you in lieu of the kinds of inspections you've got. The other thing we'd like to prove out is, you know, its use on our, our uh, EHV system and see how it works. Again, IND, you know, has done the testing that would say that it's a perfectly good application. But, uh, you know, we think it would be valuable to find that out, obviously, because, you know, the distances involved mean they generally go through, you know, terrains and oftentimes, you know, pretty significant terrains. And, you know, um, any inspection is somewhat suspect, even if you, you, you know, you're not going to walk it. And if you fly it, even with uh, helicopters, you don't necessarily get, you know, kind of the uh, ability to see every defect like uh, the Tony's pictures have described, you know, in your conductor, you know. Finding, you know, a gunshot that's underneath the conductor is going to be really hard from a helicopter. So anyway, Tony, I'll let you go. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I thought I'd just put this slide up as a bit of a teaser. This is, uh, this is on that steel tower transmission line. So here's a burst of activity. You can see the time axis down the bottom. Uh, it started at about 3 p.m. Uh, sort of kept going until about 8 p.m went away for a while, came back at about 1 a.m. in the morning, uh, went through, through through breakfast and then sort of tailed away a bit over the course of the next day. It's not right at a structure, it's actually 50 to 100 metres away. It's high enough energy. Uh, the energy chart, this is a location versus time chart. so. Uh, but the energy was high enough to uh, sit up and take notice. So, you know, this is typical of a case where you think, look at it and think, well, what is it? What do we reckon it is? So, so just have a guess, think about it, and I'll show you how we uh, worked out what this one is. Tony, if they're really brave, they can type it in the chat what they think their guess is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, first of all, the movement. Uh, in the initial burst, it moved, uh, you know, like uh, 10 metres fairly rapidly over about uh, 15 minutes. Um, and then it settled down to a slower rate of movement over the next day. Um, 
but it definitely has moved. Uh, so that's an interesting fact, something perhaps being blown by the wind. It also, there are echoes. So you can see the, the uh, detections inside the red circles and the e echoes we have found purely through an empirical observation quite often indicate that the problem is not on the monitored power line, it's on an associated power line, either a tap line or an underbuilt uh, subsidiary circuit. And so um, we go into, you know, it's the easiest way for this one is just go to Google Earth and see what the construction is. And you can see there is underbuilt 34.5 kV. The steel tower transmission line is the thing we're actually monitoring. Um, and ring up and the crew go out and replace or remove a mylar balloon off the 34.5 kV. So this is a typical example of interpretation of the results to try and get a handle on what is out there, you know, what's actually causing this. And sometimes you know, other times you, you're still guessing and the only solution is to get someone to go and have a look. No doubt in 20 or 50 years time, uh, the system will tell a drone to go out and take some video of it and send it back to base for interpretation. But right now it's a call to the crew to go and have a look. We also uh, went through a period of very cold weather um, uh, St. Louis, Missouri got down to minus 17, I think, Celsius. Uh, this, the orange curve in this is the temperature inside the control unit box. So you can see it gets down to minus eight. And our rule of thumb is always that inside the box is about 10 degrees Celsius warmer than outside the box. So it matched up with the uh, Bureau uh, of Meteorology data quite well. But you can see that when it really got cold, um, there were multiple structures that started to show uh, uh, signals, generate signals. Uh, it could be that this is ice buildup. Um, but yeah, there's, the system does uh, give you some pretty teasing insights somewhere sometimes to say, well, you know, you've got an extra dimension of information about what's happening out on the network and uh, over time no doubt uh, you know the network the asset managers and so on will understand what this means and what risk it poses to the business for us this was just a very interesting um, uh, piece of data ind technologies view is that Right now, all the stuff we've talked about are operational benefits. Uh, so you've got things like compliance management for vegetation contractors, you've got early fault detection that prevents outages and fire starts. Asset management, uh, we're seeing some of our customers start to get into this benefit area. And that is, instead of just doing a, a time-based you know, service life based approach to uh, end of life, uh, then maybe the EFD data is a good, uh, a good guide as to when assets really need replacement. We see transformers, for instance, 98% of the transformers on, our, on the distribution networks we monitor are absolutely fine. 2% are singing. They've been damaged, they've got excessive partial discharge. So maybe you just need to pay attention to those. Then you've got the possibility of business transformation, new business processes to move towards a predictive control room. And some of our customers are actually looking seriously at this as having a, a pre-control room, uh, which tries to manage risk on the network rather than respond to faults as they happen. And then eventually there's possible blue sky future possibly new business models in the in the industry. So this just, you know, we're looking at this technology at a point in time, very early in its development and deployment. 
Uh, so, but the longer term, I think it's going to have a big impact and could make quite a difference to the utility industry. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm sure we can have a Q and I. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was, you guys, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful presentation. You know, feel free to just unmute yourself if you have questions now, um, or you can type them in the chat, uh, your call. So let's open up the floor here. Anyone have questions or comments for the group? I can see some in the in the chat here, but uh, go ahead. Sorry, I cut across someone there. Yeah, John Martinez, First Energy. I was just going to ask, what I may have missed it in the presentation, but what distance do the uh, sensors cover? Uh, they are three miles apart on distribution networks, John. Um, the signal attenuation on distribution networks is dominated by the amount of branching there is. So we think, although we haven't yet proven it, that they could go to five miles apart on transmission because a lot of transmission lines have no branching at all. Um, but right at the moment, it's one every three miles on transmission circuits. Thank you. Okay, I might run through some of the ones I see in the chat. Um, so uh, someone has asked about the uh, splices and uh, detecting splice failures. The answer is yes, we have detected them and we are actually monitoring a number of splices in Australia and the US to see you know, what is the risk when we pick up a splice that looks bad, uh, but visibly when you inspect it, there is absolutely no difference between it and every other splice in the neighborhood uh, that doesn't show up on our system. Um, so we're monitoring some. I think this coming uh, summer fire season in Victoria here, we will be replacing a number of splices or our customers will be replacing a number of splices before the fire season based on the results of EFT. Multiple clamp and connector failures. Uh, yeah, that's from Andrew. Yeah, we certainly see clamp uh, problems, dodgy clamps that are starting to go. Um, and one of our customers had a uh, an employee who's uh, a bit of a nerd about metallurgy, and he actually took home took home one of these clamps and put it under a, uh, a very fancy microscope and said, "Yes, there's definitely been micro arcing from the." Uh, conductor to the clamp uh, inside this clamp. And uh, yeah, that's what we apparently, and uh, the early fault detection system was picking up those micro arcing events.